I want to inform you that the Philippines is launching its first microsatellite to watch over the weather patterns as a learning from Yolanda. And unfortunately, they are naming the microsatellite as Diwata. Um, uh, you know, Diwata is not a very good name spiritually. Let's pray for our nation that, that the Lord will will watch over us and the lack of knowledge of our leaders will not put our nation in harm's way with all the more reason there should be a prophetic watchman's anointing in the philippines because the weather will be governed by the lord through his intercessors praying and not really through science and technology Another thing that is uh, take, taking my attention in the internet is that in Poland, December 2015, 70,000 to 150,000 people gathered in Poland to declare that they are ready to physically defend Europe from Islamic terrorism. So it's now a physical preparation for Islamic terrorist threat and it looks like a prelude to what may be a religious war. Let's take note of that and lift that up to the Lord in prayer. Um, Pope Francis made a statement that also captured my attention. This was addressed to the elements of the Catholic Church but he said something about religious fundamentalism. It's religious fundamentalism, he said, must be combated. People must not insist that they know the truth and that they have the truth. We must be tolerant with other religious views. We must be open and pluralistic. And uh, it means that we must not be fanatical. I am taking note of this because in the next few years, it will be more difficult for Christians to stand squarely on the truth because you will be called a fundamentalist. If you say that Christ is the only way, you are a fundamentalist. If you say that the scriptures is the revealed word of God and it contains the truth that cannot be broken, you are a fundamentalist. If you say that marriage is just for man and woman, you are a fundamentalist. There is a rising trend against fundamentalism that will make it very hard for Christians to stand on their faith in the next few years. So let's just pray about that. On the other hand, there is really a strong sweep of one world religion movement all over the world. Last October 2015, 50 faiths were represented in Salt Lake City, Utah, to unite all religions, and they began to make some symbols of unity, Judaism, Christianity, uh, uh, Islam, and all the others there, to declare that we serve and believe in one God, but we call him by other names, but he's just the same. So this is already a fulfillment of what the book of Revelation says about a one world faith. Also, the trouble between Iran and Saudi Arabia is quickly turning out a fulfillment of what I understand is a prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 38 of the kings of the north and kings of the south. This is Iran, this is Saudi Arabia. And these are the places where Iran and Saudi are fighting what is known as proxy war. They are really the ones fighting, but not yet in their own battleground. So Iran is supporting groups in Iraq. Saudi is supporting groups there. Syria, the government of Syria is being supported by Iran, while the rebels are being supported by Saudi Arabia. Then Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen. So... It's fast shaping up to be a scenario for the Ezekiel 38 war. The whole place is already 
being set up for prophetic fulfillment. Volcanoes are acting up worldwide. According to the European Science Foundation, they are preparing for extreme volcanic activity this year 2016 and onwards. And uh, Perry Stone says that this is in line with the prophecy in Joel chapter 2 that in the last days there will be signs in the earth beneath blood, fire, and vapor of smoke will appear. So the way he interprets that, which I believe also is reasonable, blood and fire and vapor of smoke refer to the earth beneath showing signs of shaking in the last days. So the earth is bearing witness of the fact that we are in the last days. Jonathan Kahn, who is being criticized in the States for his Shemitah uh, teaching, is saying that the Shemitah is being confirmed. If you are watching your evening news, the business news, there are economic jitters in the market right now. Let's continue to watch because the Shemitah year has not yet finished. It is September 2015 to September 2016. Anything can happen. It has been confirmed by history that in a Shemitah year, always, without exception, major global things happen, also including even in Israel. So let's just keep watch. Now, Revive Asia Conference. Revive Asia. This happened in Queen Sirikit National Convention Center, Bangkok, Thailand, which by itself is a breakthrough for Thailand because Thailand has never hosted an Asian conference of churches and Christians for Asia. And Queen Sirikit National Convention Center has never hosted a Christian convention. It cost the Thai Christians 3 million baht more than to host the convention. And they did it as an act of faith. And among their worship leaders uh, was a Filipina, but she is not uh, reflected there in the poster. And these are the main speakers, Heidi Baker, Bill Johnson, Randy Clark. If you Google them in the internet, especially Bill Johnson, you would uh, find a lot of criticisms against them, even among Christians. But take it with a grain of salt. I'll share what I have received from the Lord through this conference. This was a different conference from the usual conferences that I and my wife would always attend. There was no specific prophetic pronouncement except for one thing. David Damien, one of our speakers, I'll feature him in one of these slides here, an Egyptian Christian either prophesied or gave an interpretation of a prophetic passage that 2016 will mark the beginning of the clash of kingdoms. He has a unique interpretation of Matthew 24, verse 7, which says that there shall be nations against nations, but the next line that follows is kingdom against kingdom, singular. What are the, what are the kingdoms that will clash? He believes that it is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. After nations against nations, the sporadic encounters between God's forces and Satan's forces will now begin to escalate in frontal confrontation beginning 2016. That's what he believes. And I will explain to you why he believes in that based on Isaiah chapter 19. There, are, there is no story about divine counsel, teleportation, talk with angels, but it is heavy with prophetic blessings, activation and impartation. And this is the unique thing one thing probably the singularly most solid thing i have received together with how they interpret father's love they insist that you should not wait for revival 
Christians have been praying for revival, waiting for revival, as if it is something that will come out supernaturally and will sweep the nation. But in that meeting, in that conference, they say, revival is now. The kingdom of God is now. It depends on you. If you will ask for it and if you move for it, it will be now. I will explain later on how this works. But one other thing that is very unique about this conference is that they insist to see numbers in the moves of God. When we say that we move in the prophetic, when we say that we are moving in revival, they say, let us see the numbers. Because in the book of Acts, revival was followed by numbers. Where are the people you said were touched by the Lord in revival? Because there were 3,000 immediately in the preaching of the Apostle Peter when the Holy Spirit came upon them in mighty power. The Bible counted figures right away in Acts 2.34 and then in Acts 2.47, the Lord added to their number daily. So this was the thing that was different from the other conferences I've attended. There was not much emphasis on numbers. But right now, Revival, Revive Asia insists. Where are the numbers? Where are the nations? Psalm chapter 2. Ask the nations for your inheritance. So, word of caution. In that conference, there are many things there which are associated with Pentecostals. Especially being slain in the spirit. So, if you have a bias against being slain in the spirit, holy laughter, holy weeping, bodily shaking, then you will probably be uncomfortable in that seminar. The funny thing in that conference is this. Bill Johnson, Randy Clark, Heidi Baker is just explaining the moves of the Holy Spirit. They have not yet prayed for impartation, but people were already falling down in their chairs. One beside me, Beside me, another behind me, Americans, Nigerians, Vietnamese, all the way from seats A to E. We were 5,000 people in a hall. People were already receiving the glory of the Lord. And I have a teaching on that. I cannot incorporate it here tonight because they have a functional explanation for the physical manifestation. I will probably reserve that in the teaching on the School of Prophets because, no, let me just give this to you in 30 seconds or one minute. There are three realms of the supernatural. The realm of faith, the next higher realm is the realm of anointing, and the third highest realm is the realm of glory. You cannot arrive at anointing if you do not operate in faith. You cannot see glory if you do not operate in anointing. I will explain that because I am still listening to the CDs because their written materials are all in Thai. So I just bought all the CDs, teaching CDs, and they, oper they explain why are all these things happening. But they also are very quick to explain that this is not mandatory. You will be surprised that Randy Clark, the chief of all of them, and the one who started the Toronto Revival, when he started the Revival, he had absolutely no manifestation of falling down. And yet, when he laid hands on others, they were falling down. They were. And he explained why it's not the same. So, we came with an open heart and open mind to learn and to check everything with scriptures. Now, let's just get an overview of the basic teachings of the speakers there. Let me start with Bill Johnson. Revival is now depending on your faith. They have a teaching in CD which explains the realms of faith. There are realms of supernatural, faith, anointing, and glory. But in the realm of faith, there are sub-realms. Sub-realms, because you can measure your 
For example, there is mustard seed faith. There is little faith. There is great faith. And then there is your faith. Then there is a gift of faith. Not your faith, but it is God's faith implanted in your heart. So there are realms of faith that make you move in the realms of anointing. Then they have another level of teaching. But they insist that we must be a people of faith. The just shall live by faith. And faith must produce revival and faith must produce signs, wonders, and miracles. And faith must see souls saved. They are so strict on this that if you say you have faith, they will ask, where is revival? Where are your signs and wonders? Where are the souls that are saved? Because God is great. And faith moves a great God. So, this guy is a doctor in theology. All three of them, the three main speakers, were all doctors in theology. Randy Clark, Bill Johnson, and Heidi Baker. So, in the Inisila, these are not people who just had an experience in the sidewalk and then all of a sudden taught about the scriptures. In fact, their theology came first ahead of their experience. I'll tell you the testimony of Randy Clark later on, but here is... This one main thing that they are teaching. Randy Clark is a sucker for glory. He insists that if we have never seen and felt the glory of God in our Christian life, we better ask for it now. Otherwise, we might end our life here on earth without ever having seen the glory of God. Everything in the Christian experience, must end with an experience of the glory of God. Moses will never move without the presence of the glory of God. God moves in power, healing the sick, raising the dead. It is his desire to reveal his goodness, his glory in all the earth. Signs and wonders shall accompany those who believe, and glory shows the goodness of God. Now, I feel very sympathetic with Randy Clark. He went through four years of bachelors of theology, went to two years of masters of divinity, and went to a few more years in doctor of divinity, only to end with this conclusion. It is not theology that converts souls. It is the glory of God. The glory of God. What will you do in Mozambique and Tajikistan with your theology? But if they see the dead raised, if they see the blind recover his sight, then by the thousands and by the millions, they will ask, who is your God? So they are saying, if we want to fulfill Psalm chapter 2, ask the nations for your inheritance. Nothing short than the glory of God will do it. You can attend all the Bible studies and get all the certificates and all the diplomas and all the citations. If there is no glory of God in your life and in your ministry, in our life and ministry, we will not bring the nations to the feet of the Lord Yeshua. Now, here is another fantastic paradigm shift. This, this girl is really one of a kind. Heidi Baker. I've heard about her, but everything I have heard about her is nothing compared to my actual experience of seeing her. This girl is crazy. This girl is really crazy. She is such a terrific joker. She loves to make people laugh. But she is very, very anointed. She is not governed by rules of behavior. She takes the mic 
And then, she kneels on the floor when it is her time to lecture. And she sings in the spirit and she laughs. And then she prophesies the love of God. And then she stands up and she lectures again. And then she dramatizes her lecture. Now, this is what I received from her which is so humbling and very true. Love. What about love? The only motivation to ministry acceptable to God is the love of the Father. If you are in ministry not moved by the love of God, our service is an abomination to the Lord. What is the search for anointing and power and effective answers to prayer if we are not moved by the love of God? For show, for display, that we are anointed, that we can get people slain. The only thing acceptable at the throne for all that we do is the love of God. Glory comes to those who are filled with the Father's love. The key to revival is to be immersed ourselves in the love of the Father and then for us to go out into the world and to love others like Jesus loved. So, for that, we must really pay attention to soaking. We must be immersed in the Father's love. We must do everything in the love of the Heavenly Father. She said, more is accomplished by spending time in God's presence than by doing anything else. She gave a testimony of her adjustment to the Father's love. And I'd like to encourage the New Hope Core Group team that when we went to Thailand 2012, we were not alone. Because Heidi Baker, shortly after we came, was also told by the Lord to also go to Phuket, Thailand. She also did not know why. Brother Joseph was there in the seminar. When we saw each other, we hugged one another. The guy who hosted us. And he could not believe seeing us and we could not believe seeing him. And we almost blurted out the same thing over lunch. This is already the answer to what we prayed for in that giant statue of Buddha where we formed a circle and prayed for revival to come to Thailand. We did that in 2012. In that same year, Heidi Baker was also instructed by the Lord to go to Phuket also and to just walk in the streets of Phuket for three days. Just walk. And she asked the Lord, what will I do here? And the Lord told her, let me see how you share my love for the people of Thailand. When the mayor of Phuket heard that she was coming, bodyguards were sent, vehicle was because she was very famous, and she prayed, the Lord said, do not ride the mayor's car. Walk alone in the streets of Thailand, in the night streets, Watch the people and ask me what I feel for the people of Phuket. All the gays, all the lesbians, all the homosexuals, all the prostitutes. And she walked the streets of Thailand. And upon the prompting of the Lord, when the Lord said, stop. What now, Lord? Just ask this person with a one-liner question. Tell me your story. Because if you really love people, you would be willing to listen to their story. So she stopped at one stand. A prostitute was there. Miss, tell me your story. Three days she listened to the people's stories and praying that the love of God will burn in her heart for the people of Thailand. 
the Lord said, do not minister to the people of Thailand unless you burn in your heart with love for the people of Thailand. I don't want you to do anything without my love for the people of Thailand. Bill Johnson introduced a practice on how to be carriers of the Father's love. He was looking for healthy food and they were being sold in a store which is occultic, but their food is really very healthy. So this is what he would do. He would soak, would spend time in his house worshiping the Lord and asking the Lord, Lord, fill me with your love. I am going to that store. It has so many idols, so many abominations, but you love these people. These people do not know that these are an abomination to you, but you love them. So, in his soaking, he would wait and wait, and when he begins to weep, when he begins to sense the love of the Father, that he carries it in his being. Then he goes to the store. No preaching, no Bible study, no distribution of tracts, just prophesying in the atmosphere the love of the Heavenly Father. He comes into the store and speaks peace to the store. I bring the Father's love into the store. And he would just buy whatever things he would like. And then after he pays, he just would go out. No preaching, no asking, if you die today, where will your soul go? No tactics like that. Just bringing the love of the Father into the store. One day, the owner of the store said, Sir, sir, excuse me, come here. May I know your name? I am Bill Johnson. What do you do? Well, I serve the Lord. Why are you asking, sir? Bill Johnson asked the store. Because ever since you kept coming back in the store, something different has happened to me and my store and my family. And it always happens when you are here. I just feel loved. I cannot explain it. Who are you? What are you? What is your magic? Sir, there is no magic. The Father really loves you. Please tell me about Him. I want to know. That is doing ministry in the power of the Father's love. Never do ministry apart from the power of the Father's love because you will bring defilement in your ministry. Because the spirit world will pick up the smell, the sight, and the sound of your grumbling spirit because you are busy and you have to minister. If you cannot do it in love, better not. Because the only justification for ministry is the Father's love. Purity. As our hearts become pure, our vision becomes clearer. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And Heidi Baker made a fantastic lecture. That purity is the result of receiving the Father's love. When you are filled with the Father's love, you shall seek no other pleasure apart from His love for you. Why do we seek other pleasures? Because we are not filled with the Father's love. There is no satisfaction in our hearts. So we look at pornography. We take a little bit of these vices. Because we are not filled with the Father's love. Purity is the product of being filled with the Father's love. Now, here is another speaker. This guy is really another brand of crazy preacher. His name is Matthew Kuruvila. He is an Indian. He is a champion of the doctrine of the Jesus in you. In his sessions, he would correct the natural, uh, usual way of speaking to the Father, although that is all right. That's not really wrong. 
But he is insisting that it would be better if we learn to live the Jesus who is in us. Because Jesus is in us. The love of Jesus, the authority of Jesus is the power of the Christian. So, ang point niya, Amone, just be aware that Jesus is in you, in you. Wherever you go, be aware that Jesus goes. Wherever you arrive, Jesus arrives. Just be aware of that. You go to an office, you say, Sir, I'm here. No, Jesus is here. You are simply a carrier of Jesus. You're just the temple. You're not really the main guy. The main guy is Jesus, Yeshua, who lives in you. Shift the focus from you to Yeshua. So do not say, I arrived in the office. Put it in your mind. When you got into your office, Yeshua just arrived in your office. When you sat, sat down beside your office mate, it was not really you who sat down. Yeshua sat down beside your office mate. And then he said, look at your hands. So everybody, five times people, raise up your hands. Okay, shout this with me. These are the hands of Jesus. <laughs> And then your mouth is the mouth of Yeshua. So, our real calling in life is we are Jesus carriers. You are not a businessman. You are a royal priest disguised as a businessman. That is what he says. So, whatever you are, you are really a Jesus carrier. Where you go, Jesus goes. Where you arrive, Jesus arrives. And the place where you land cannot remain the same if Jesus lands there. Now, here is another terrific speaker, David Demian, an Egyptian Christian. He is a sucker for family. Family. He and Bill Johnson developed a message on the Lord's Prayer, which is about a kingdom where the king is our father. This is what they said. The Lord's Prayer says, Our Father in heaven. Then there, a line there says, Your kingdom come. The kingdom is not a corporation. It is not run by a board. It is run by a family council of one king and as many sons and daughters. Here is another guy, Gijun Chu. He did not speak long. There were workshops that he was the speaker because there were sessions that we were divided into workshops. There were four workshops. I wanted to attend all, but you can only attend one workshop. So in another workshop, he was talking about authority. Our authority comes from our sonship, not from employment. Workers have wages, sons and daughters have inheritance. Christians must change their mindsets from serving as servants to serving as sons and daughters of the king. You are serving the family business not as an employee, not as a servant. You are serving as a son and daughter of the king. And that carries authority that the servant does not have. Now, I want to tell you quickly about their testimonies. Incredible testimony. Matthew Corovilla was paralyzed in a horrific car accident. And he was totally healed. After one and one half years that he could not move, and the doctor said that he will never walk again. First few months, he was looking for medical help, but they all gave up on him, and he cried to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to him, on this date, get up on your bed, get up out of your bed and you will rise up. The day came and he rose up and the doctors could not explain because all his nerves were not connected from the neck down. So he was a product of a miracle. His church grew from very few to 15,000 in seven years. And in another seven years, he established a network of 500 churches with 500,000 members. And he is a global speaker. He is such a vibrant speaker because he said, Jesus is in me. 
Randy Clark was a Baptist. Now, I need to say this very carefully because there are many Baptists here. I myself am a Baptist, but he was a Baptist. He had a Bachelor of Science in Religious Studies in 1974. He took his Master's of Divinity from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And then many years later, he pursued Doctor of Ministry. But when he was just an MDiv, not yet a Doctor of Ministry, he started a church, has been pastoring for seven years. Here he is speaking before us. This is the Hall of Queen Sirikit National Convention Center, speaking through an interpreter. They just come in jeans and polo shirt. They were very, very informal. Many people came in their suit and tie, but they are cowboys, just like ordinary guys in the street. And he was very dissatisfied with his early ministry. He was wondering why the church, his church, was so powerless. And he was already MDib. And he noticed that his church was so far from the book of Acts. And he checked history and he saw that there were very powerful revivals in history. It did not end with the book of Acts, the Moravians, the Holiness Movement, Charles Finney, John Wesley, the Azusa Street Revival. And he complained to the Lord. Lord, I am born in the wrong season. I want revival. He was so disheartened with his ministry that in a complaint before the Lord, he said, Lord, unless you transform your ministry, unless you transform my ministry, I will no longer sing many of the praise songs to you because I have never experienced it. And I cannot sing that praise song to you honestly because I have never seen your power in my church. When he was still in Bible school and seminary, he was taught that signs and wonders of the book of Acts have already ceased because the church was already born and that the scriptures was already complete, exactly as we were taught in Bible school. He was also taught that the last days is the Laodicean church age, where the church will be compromising and lukewarm. So he began to accept that the church today is Laodicean because that was what he was taught. So he held on to these views for many years, that the church is weak, that the church is compromising. We'll have to do the best we can. And then in the thesis, because they were required to submit a thesis on the book of Acts, there were 50 topics to choose from given by the Bible school, and not one of them was healing. And he asked the professor, can I write a subject on healing? The professor said, okay. But when he submitted his thesis, he came up with the conclusion that healing, healing and other blessings are part of salvation. And the professor did not like it. He said, no, healing is different. Salvation is one thing. Salvation is accomplishment. Healing, you cannot claim it as the same as salvation. So he wept and cried before God when after pastoring for so many years, his church was just 100 plus members. And then this is the point when I cried on my seat listening to him. He was giving his testimony and he was teary-eyed when he recounted that he began to sing this song to the Lord. When on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. That is a beautiful Baptist song that we Baptists love to sing. This is, these are the words of the song. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. He sang that song to the Lord. I sang that song 2011 to the Lord in my room after the NPG because I was so upset that I could not see 
the power of the Lord in many of the so-called Christian ministries that we were doing, that I was doing. The same song he sang, the same song I sang. And he reviewed his Bible and he found out in Matthew chapter 4 that when Jesus was on earth, when Yeshua was on earth, he preached the good news of the kingdom and healed every disease and sickness among the people. And he became so popular that news spread about him all over Syria. And people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, suffering severe pain, demon possessed, having seizures. And, and he healed them and large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. He said, Lord, why is not your church like this anymore. There are no sick people bringing their sick members to a church. You will ne never imagine bringing somebody sick to the church. There is no such thing as large crowds following Christians to be healed. And he cried, why are we so less than what you were when you were here? He also saw Matthew chapter 8. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he healed. And when evening came, verse 16, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him. And he drove out the spirits with the word and he healed all the sick. And this was to fulfill what was spoken to the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and cared our diseases. So he was very upset. Why is my church not like this? So Randy began to pray for this power to be restored back to his church. And he ordered his church to fast and pray for revival for three days. Fasting and praying. First day, nothing happened. Second day, nothing happened. On the third day, the presence of God fell. And in his words, people were slain in the spirit. They started to fall down. But not him. Randy Clark did not fall down. He did not jerk. He did not cry and weep. He was very, very normal while all the church was being slain and was born the so-called Toronto Revival. Randy Clark. Among those he prayed for, now this is interesting, he did not manifest. Wala siya manifestation. But he started to pray for people out of the revival. Among those he prayed for were Heidi Baker and Leif Hetland. Henry Madaba was also one. But I'll mention just two testimonies. I'll start with Leif Hetland. Leif was just an ordinary Christian. He attended a Randy Clark revival meeting. Randy Clark laid hands on him. Just ordinary ministry, no fireworks. After Randy Clark prayed over him in a revival meeting. The ministry of Leif Hitland began to explode. He began to preach just one message, just the Father's heart, just the Father's love, just one main message. And that one main message took him to 78 nations and six continents. Preaching the Father's love in the glory of His presence. He operates in 22 nations. And over 1 million people have already been saved during his years in ministry. And he is the only Christian in the world allowed by the Taliban in Afghanistan to preach the gospel. The only one. All others are not allowed. What is his passport? What is his basis when he is interviewed? I come here, sir, to talk to you about the Father's love. Approved. And then all the Muslims, the Taliban, terrorists, they call them terrorists sometimes, would attend his meetings and watch. He said, Islam is not a problem. It is a promise. This is in Afghanistan. I've seen his video in Manila because I attended a one-day seminar of Leif Hitland. And in the seminar... I've, I've met him personally. In the seminar, he showed videos of his meetings in Afghanistan, in Muslim countries, including Pakistan. And as a security measure, there is a space between him 
the stage and the crowd. But when he begins to say, all those who want to receive the Father's love come up front, you will be shocked. The whole sea of humanity would come rushing ga pa una una to be laid hands on Muslims and Hindus. This is a picture of one of his meetings. Rushing, inagaway, touch us with the Father's love. Touch us with the Father's love. Babies that are sick would be drawn to him. And he formed this organization, LMOP, Loving Muslims on Purpose. This is his worldwide movement. And he brings millions of Muslims to Christ. He has prayed for the sons and daughters of kings and princes of the Muslim world. And he gives the name of Yeshua as the way to the Father's heart. And the, the Muslims are not offended. He just prays. And when the healing starts, and when the healing comes, he would ask, do you want to also receive Yeshua and the Saudi prince and the Pakistani royalty will say, yes, yes, of course. And so many of them would come to the Lord Yeshua. Heidi Baker. Heidi Baker was a Christian missionary. She started with her husband a ministry on orphanages. After 12 years, from 1980 to 1992, she was burned out. Kapoy, kapoy. Her ministry was in debt. Her churches were about to close. Funds were very hard to come. And it was very tired, very tiring to just love, abuse children. So he, she took a break to go to King's College and to take up a doctor of ministry or theology program. But when she felt burnt out, she attended a Randy Clark Revival meeting. When she attended the Randy Clark Revival meeting, she just had 80 plus orphans and four churches. Two were about to close. One was only because the parents were required to attend the feeding program because there will be Bible studies after the feeding program. When she attended the Randy Clark Revival meeting, she got slain in the spirit. She could not move. She cried. She laughed for seven hours. She had to be physically carried to her place and went back the next night, got slain again. Now, when we listen to stories like this, oh, being slain, Pentecostal na, hindi uh, mana amuni, wala mana sa Bible. I'll discuss that another time because I'm tempted to defend all these things, but this is not the right place and the right time to do it. I'll just tell you the rest of the story. After that experience, she now has 5,000 churches in Mozambique, 10,000 network of churches in over 20 nations, and thousands of orphanages, feeding centers, health clinics, primary and secondary schools, cottage industries, and livelihood programs. And she has what is known as the Iris Ministries. And today, she is called Mama Heidi in all the continent of Africa, Muslims invite her to come. Mama Heidi, come here. Mama Heidi, come here. What changed? The glory of God. The glory of God. The love of the Heavenly Father. She just loved the Heavenly, the, the Heavenly Father and the love of the Heavenly Father burned in her heart. And as Yeshua would love the people, she felt that love which she never felt before. And so, she became Mama Heidi in the entire Africa. These are pictures of people in her website waiting to be prayed for in the dead of the night. Her ministry is accompanied by signs, wonders, and miracles. And she introduced a teaching which got my attention. Because after explaining the effect of demon possession on other people, she introduced this very thought-provoking teaching. She said, Lord, I want to be possessed by you. Because she observed 
how people behave when demons possess them. When demons possess other people, they have supernatural powers. When demons possess people, they have supernatural strength. When demons possess people, their characters change. The very mild ones become very strong and very brave because they are demon-possessed. And so she began to cry out after the Randy Clark meeting, Lord, possess me. I want to be possessed by Jesus, by Yeshua. And then she would pray for these people, Oh Lord, possess these people. I've never heard that theory in Bible school taught before. Is there ever a prayer for the Lord to possess? But that is really her prayer. And she would sing that out in our conference. She would do humming, prophetic humming, before she starts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then she would begin to flow. Possess us, Lord. Possess us. And then she would begin to lecture. And the one thing about her is that her healings are medically verified. She became so famous and so many people contributed money to her that mga hisaon, people became envious of her and had her investigated for fraud. But what came out in September 2010 was the Southern Medical Journal establishing the fact that there was evidence of significant improvements in auditory and visual function among subjects exhibiting impairment before receiving prayer from the ministry. Even the non-Christian medical society said there were solid improvements in the life of the people prayed for. David Damien, Egyptian, he preached about restoring the family, making the church a real family. And he also believed that the Gentile church is going to make its way back to Jerusalem in the spirit realm. Uh, I have not sufficient time to explain how they develop the theology of the family in revival. But he said, based on Malachi chapter 4, there is no such thing as revival when the family is restored. Because the word of God says that the spirit of Elijah will restore the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the father. You speak of revival, David Damien will ask you, let me see that in your family. Where is the revival in your family? Because the spirit of Elijah will restore the family. The kingdoms will be shaken um, and, and the, the church will be set free from the powers that have defiled his name and the principalities must be overcome. Because he was an Egyptian, he explained that the gods of Egypt have not really been uh, they were defeated in uh, the Exodus, but they have taken a new face and they continue in the form of Freemasonry. And that is why their influence is all over the world. And he said that this must be overcome in the last wave of revival before the Lord Jesus Christ comes. Here is his interesting proposition. He said, that the last century will belong to the Eastern Church. The Eastern Church will take the final wave of the gospel to the rest of the world and, he said, back to Jerusalem with the anointing of the wise men from the East. He believes that in the last days, men and women from the East will be used by the Lord to forerun or trumpet the church, the, the the, the soon and coming king. How will the church do it? He insists the church must be one family. The body of Christ must be one. He preaches on Psalm 133, Behold how good and beautiful it is for brethren to dwell in unity together because the anointing will come in the spirit of harmony and unity. He gave a testimony of a 10-minute prayer and praise meeting in China because his heart, he fell in love with China, the, the church in China. He arranged for a two-day seminar in China. The police learned about it. The first day was canceled. They only had two days. So the, two, the second day came and the police were still there. So the elders met. What are we going to do? They said, 
let's have a 10-minute prayer and praise meeting just before lunch. That's the only window of time that we can have a conference. So in that restaurant that they went to and agreed to go to for their lunch, 10 minutes before, they had a quick gathering and just prayed and sang praise to the Lord. And then the Chinese guards came and began to arrest David Damien. And little by little, one Chinese pastor began to stand up and said, Sir, if you will take him, you have to take me. Then another Chinese pastor, who have been to jail before, many of their friends have not come back, began to stand up again and surrounded David Damien. And the guards would ask, Who are you and why would you do this? They said, Sir, we are one family. And members of the family will die for one another. That's the 10-minute revival meeting of David Damien in China. Uh, he gave a very uh, interesting exp uh, explanation, the problem of the church. One time, he was hosted by a couple in a country, and he was about to stay in the house. But sanginsugat sa airport, he sensed that the husband and wife were not speaking to each other. So he knew that they were quarreling before he came. So he began to develop a severe migraine. Then he was praying in the Spirit, Lord, I don't want to stay in the house where there is tension between my host, husband, and wife. I know that they are fighting. I do not know what they are fighting about. Can you help me escape? I want to go to the hotel. I want to sleep there. And the Lord was gracious. And so he said, I just want to stay in the hotel. I want to spend time with the Lord. And the hosts agreed. But in the hotel, his migraine and headache would not stop. Then he asked the Lord, Lord, why are, why are you not taking my migraine and headache? This was the answer that came to him. I am giving this to you so that you will know that I can come and visit the church, but often find it so uncomfortable I cannot stay. When there is tension, offense among God's children, I cannot stay. I feel awkward and sad. This is what the Holy Spirit feels about His church. He may visit, but He cannot stay. He feels the tension in our fellowship. When we speak against one another, when we backbite one another, when we do not love one another, the Holy Spirit feels the tension. That is why what we get is visitation, not habitation, because we are not one family loving one another. He gave the Isaiah 19 highway. One of the strong signs of the Lord's return. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and Assyria, the Egyptians to Assyria. The Egyptians and Assyrians will worship together. And in that day, Israel will be the third along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. He said this is about to be fulfilled. Because this is a fulfillment of the promise of the Lord to Abraham. To your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. This was the promise of the promised land to Abraham, the Nile in Egypt and the Euphrates in Iraq. Now, he said, we are about to see the fulfillment of this. Because what happened to the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and what happened in Iraq and Syria through the ISIS, these are counter moves of Satan because he already knew that the Lord is already preparing the highway from Egypt and Assyria to reach Israel because the remnant of the Lord will worship in Israel the Egyptian Christians and the Assyrian Christians. Assyria is Syria and Iraq. Now, in the old world, they were Assyria. But in the modern world, it's now Syria and Iraq. And he said, as an Egyptian, I understand that this was a counter move of the enemy. This was a counter move of the enemy. And the march is now towards Israel. What's this year? Watch Israel this year because the movement is taking us from Egypt to Assyria. You watch 2016, 2017, something will happen to Israel. I, Isaiah 19 will be fulfilled. And because of this, he joined the church in China for the B2J, Back to Jerusalem movement. He fell in love with the Chinese people. He explained why. 
Why will the Lord use the Chinese to bring the gospel to Israel? Because of all the lands on earth, the land of China has the most martyrs' blood together with Russia. And the blood of the saints are crying out to the Lord. Where the blood is shed, revival will explode. The most powerful church is the church in China because that is where the blood of the martyrs were shed. So he is a member of the Back to Jerusalem movement. Their theory is they are going to raise up uh, by 2030, 247 million uh, Christians, which will make China the biggest Christian nation in the world. And they will bring back the gospel to Jerusalem from China because they will do it full circle. What will convince the Jews? What will provoke them to jealousy? Romans 11. This is what he explained. Something will provoke the Jews to make them be open to Yeshua. I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them, the Apostle Paul said. What will arouse the envy of the Jews? The glory of God manifested by signs, wonders, miracles, healings, and the prophetic because the Jews believe that they have a copyright on this. They think that this is their property. When they see the Gentiles move in power, they said, why in the world do you have that that belongs to us? They will say, because we serve Yeshua HaMashiach. The Jews will say, that was the carpenter we crucified. And the Gentiles will say, oh, he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And this will bring revival in Israel. It was not apologetics, Heidi Baker said, that won many to Christ in Muslim Africa. It was the love of God manifested in signs, wonders, and miracles. So this is a revivalist meeting with another revivalist in a Muslim country. This is the Africa outpouring revival meetings. This is in Af These are Muslims. So the underlying theory of the conference as we bring this to a close is this. I am now surprising everything. Jesus is coming soon. We need to offer the nations as our gifts to him. But we must insist that the revival, the kingdom of God must be seen now. It must result in revival. Revival must result in soul winning and missions and transformation of nations and communities. What is the biblical basis for this proposition? In the book of Acts, the disciples were endued with power from the Holy Ghost. Then they were revived. They were transformed in the book of Acts. Then they preached the word of God boldly with signs, wonders, and miracles, uh, which should only accompany the preaching of the gospel. And number four, numbers were added to them daily. And there is a traceable movement of the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and the most part of the earth, and back to Jerusalem to the Jews. Anything less than this may not be entirely useless, but is missing the mark, according to that conference. And since the glory of the last days is greater, this means that more power and glory than that of the disciples should be seen today. Greater revival, bolder proclamation of the gospel, greater signs, wonders, and miracles, more nations transformed. As I close, here is the functional explanation. How? All these fantastic stories, how do we receive that? There is no secret. The secret, so-called, is taught in the Bible. It is impartation. So, in the three-day seminar, hey, bigit sila sa impartation. They really insist on impartation. Every session, impartation. Do not break the flow of the impartation because the power of the church flowed from impartation. Look at the flow. From the Father to the Son, there was impartation. I'll show you the, quickly the verses. From, from the Son, Yeshua, to the Apostles, and to the 120 believers in the books of, book of Acts. And then from the Apostles and the 120 to the 3,000 who received the preaching of Peter, and to the new elders and the new churches in every city, and then to the world, following the pattern of impartation, commissioning, and sending out. And it should result in numbers. The Lord added to their number daily who are being saved. Here is the in the impartation, first part, the Father to the Son. John 1.32, John bear records saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Spirit fell like a dove and remained on him. Remained on him. Habitation. Sometimes we have gold dust, silver dust. That is visitation. Sometimes we have jewels, 
Gemstones, visitation. Jesus had habitation. The Spirit fell and remained on Him. This is what we must cry out for. When the Holy Spirit comes, will He remain? Why would He remain? Because this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. May we become the beloved sons and daughters of whom the Father will be well pleased. So, it's not Visitation, it's habitation. There's a difference between the Holy Spirit in us and the Holy Spirit upon us. In us, I will explain this in the next uh, sessions. La in ang Holy Spirit in us, because that is seal of ownership, deposit, anointing in us to lead us to the truth, and sanctification. In us na, in us, the Holy Spirit in us. But upon us, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, hindi nani in me, on me, and anointed me to have the power to preach. To proclaim freedom for the prisoners, deliverance, recovery of sight for the blind, healing, set the oppressed free. So, proclaim freedom of the year of the Lord's favor. That is the result of the Spirit on me, not in me, on me. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So, from the Father to the Son, first with Jesus, okay, these things are fulfilled okay so and then with the disciples from jesus he said you will receive power when the holy spirit comes upon you okay then with the believers in the book of acts tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them and all of them were filled with the holy spirit so ang gina insist nila sa seminar kung hindi kung hindi ka mag cooperate sa flaws ng importation and you make a break you will have all the theology in the world without the glory and the power because there's only one secret to this, impartation. Impartation. There are different baptisms, doctrine of baptisms, okay? There is a baptism in, we were baptized in Christ, but there is also a baptism with the Spirit and with fire. I will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. La in maning baptized into the family, la in pagidni ang baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, I'm about, this is very near the end, but I need to hammer on this because this is very life changing. I never, in all my years of study in the Bible, never caught this. It was just there that I caught this. This is really knocked out. Knock, I am really knocked out by this. When Jesus rose from the dead, and before Pentecost, before Pentecost, John chapter 20, Jesus appeared to the disciples after the resurrection. The disciples were hiding in the upper room. They were afraid. Jesus appeared to them and said, Peace be with you. And they were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, He said, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me. I am sending you. Now look at this. Verse 22. This is what I've never seen before in the scriptures. I hope we all see it tonight. With that, He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them. Sometimes, in revival meetings, we have speakers doing that and we get offended because in our doctrine, we cannot explain what in the world is this guy doing. That is what Jesus did. Are you following? He breathed on them. And He said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Okay. Nag-receive na to. Okay. Then, naka-receive na. Why did He still say, before He ascended, Wait for the Father's promise because you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Did they not already receive the Holy Spirit when Jesus breathed on them? Amun itong ginbalbal dito sa seminar. This is a different experience. Separate experience. What do you do when you breathe in? The Holy Spirit comes in. But you still need the Holy Spirit to come upon 
Jesus settled the theological dispute. Jesus breathed the Spirit into His disciples. They received the Holy Spirit in them, but He said, wait, do not minister. You are still powerless. Wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. This is what the church stopped with all its theology. There is no more coming upon. We just receive the Spirit in us. That is why the church has no power to display the glory of the Lord. So, Jesus himself, he had the Spirit of the dove descending upon him. Jesus, or Yeshua, was already the Son of God. He already had the Spirit of God in him. He himself was God. He was already perfect. The Father was well pleased with him. And yet the Spirit still had to fall upon him like a dove. Even if, if Jesus himself still needed the Holy Spirit to come upon him, how much more do we need the Spirit to come upon us? And it remained on him because the Father was well pleased with him. He saw the Spirit descending like a dove. This should be the cry of our hearts. May you come upon me, Lord, and may you remain. May I be a beloved son in whom you are well pleased. I know I am loved, but help me to be well pleasing to you. So be possessed by the Father's love. And, and he settled one theological question. Does not the Father already own us? He owns everything. Why do we still have to go into this? He said the principle of rent. What is the principle of rent? The Father owns everything. The world, the earth, the church, your body, He owns it. But the owner, when he rents his property, he cannot enter the property rented unless the renter, the one who rents the property, will allow him to come in. Kung ginulis mo na, saan si Butch, si Mylene, maglis ang ilang property, hindi na ito sila kasulod unless they are invited. Invite him to come. Welcome the Holy Spirit. Let the Father have His way in us. Invite Him in. Intimacy with God as loving ever, making Him ruler over everything in our lives. We are living in the season of the greater works than this you will do. Truly I say to you, He who believes in me, the works that I do, He will do also, and greater works than this He will do, because I go to the Father, whatever as you may name, that I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Conclusion, what is the surest evidence that revival has come when the church explodes with the love of the Father to bring to the lost world? What is the surest manifestation? Massive soul winning, cross-cultural missions, accompanied by healings, deliverance, signs, wonders, and miracles. These are the greater things. Why these are the greater things? Because outside of Galilee, outside of the area, Jesus never did anything outside of the little area. We will do greater things. He never preached to millions, but we will preach to millions. We will do greater things. Are you sure we will do greater things than Yeshua? Is that not offensive? I close with these two slides. Example, the father loves his son Yeshua. He gave him a car. But the father also loves us and Yeshua loves us. Because we are accepted accepted in God through the beloved. And they want to give us a car. So we were expecting a car to be given to us. But they give us a hammer. And Yeshua is not envious. He does not feel insecure. Because Yeshua wants us to outshine him. With his father's love. He wants us to do greater things than what he did. This is the glory of the last days. Revival fire. Now. Let us pray. Father, what I received from Thailand. Revive Asia. I pass on to my brothers and sisters, Lord. In the realm of the spirit. The father's love. The glory of the Lord. Yeshua living in us, walking in the glory of the Lord, walking in the authority of sons and daughters, 
doing everything in the love of the Heavenly Father for the world. And signs, wonders, and miracles will follow. Lord, I pass all of this to my dear brothers and sisters here. I do not know and understand how it works, but I receive the impartation that were released there for three days. And I pass on the impartation to all of the people here in the name of Yeshua. I pass on all the blessings that we have received. All the blessings that we have received, the impartation. Lord, if we have broken the spiritual line in the past, Lord, we restore now the lines of impartation from the Father to Yeshua, to the apostles, the early church, up to today. And we receive the promise of your word. We shall do greater works than what you did because you love us with an everlasting love and you fill us with your glory, your power, and your love. Lord, we seal this word of blessing and impartation in the mighty name of Yeshua and by the power of the love of the heavenly Father whose love cannot be explained for which we give all honor and glory to Him and Him alone. Amen, 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 amen.